listen to the words of this song. Oh, come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us.
sustaining this whole thing. He is supporting this entire thing. He is ultimately in control. I'm too weak to try to hold on. I'm too weak. But God's strong enough to hold it all together. So as we pray this morning, I want us to pray with that mind and that thought process. God, you are our sustainer. Now that may be why he tells us to cast our cares upon him, for he will sustain us. Let's do that this morning. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you. Dear God in heaven, I lift up your holy name that is above every name, a name that is worthy to be praised. God, I lift you up this morning to say thank you, our sustainer, our strength, our savior, our king. Lord, we need your help this morning. Lord, folks are, folks are going through sickness. Folks are battling COVID. Folks are sick. We got cancer. We don't know how else to handle it other than just bring it before you. You're in control. You're sovereign. And you know what to do. When we don't understand, we will trust you. My God, I'm going to trust you even when I do understand. And so God, I just come to you this morning. We as a church family come and bow before you. Asking you to take a moment, just a few moments, pass by our way today. Let us experience you today. Let us touch you today. And by all means, we want you to touch us. Change our lives. Change our attitudes. And God, take this moment and let us worship your holy name. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, if you want to turn in your hymnals, we'll be on page 85. And the last is all in. We'll be on the screen.
on page 89. 89. We'll sing all three verses. Glory to God. church I've never sang this song in church and I've wanted to sing it for weeks and weeks and we've practiced and I'm one of these I want to know what this song means you know Beulah that word literally means marriage and it's mentioned in Isaiah I think it's chapter 62 is the only time Beulah is used in the book of the Bible and it means marriage and it's talking about Jesus being married to Jerusalem and the righteousness that comes through him and we are his bride the Church of Christ is his, is his bride, and he is our bridegroom. And he desires that we be married to him in salvation and righteousness. 
And this morning, it's no, by no accident, we've sang about glory land and mansion in heaven and Beulah land and being married to the, the one who knows us by name, being married to the Savior and having a home promised to us in eternity with Him. Amen. But greater than that, having our sins washed white as snow through salvation through His blood that was shed for us. This morning, our last song, Sweet Beulah Land, are you married to the, bride, to the bridegroom? Do you know Him? Have you been made righteous through salvation in him?
you ready to sing that? I want y'all to do those last two verses. Just a few more days to labor. My God in heaven. Just a few more. Sometimes I get so close it feels like we're just looking for a good place to cross, don't you? y'all get to that chorus, just drop off the music. Just a few more days to labor. It's hard, but it's going to be better. Sometimes we're scared, but one day that'll all be over. Things that we have believed for so long by faith, one day become a reality and we'll see them face to face. There's been a lot of death this year, hasn't there? Hasn't there? I mean, just go on both sides for county. We've had lost Brother Randy Bertram, which in my opinion was one of the greatest pieces of salt one county's ever had. Brother Randy made this statement when I was 19 years old. I was listening to a preacher revival meeting. He said, I experience grace. I live by grace. One of these days, I'm going to get to see grace. Well, he's seeing him right now. Over on this side of the county, we watched one of the most humble of servants, Brother Bill Barnett. I oftentimes wondered if he didn't live at the hospital most of the time. Visited, met, counseled. Just a tremendous man of God. We lost him. Right down the road here, we lost Brother Tommy Williams. Man of God. Right up in North Rango, Georgia, we lost a man, many of you may not even heard of him, but a man by the name of Sammy Allen spent 40 years of his life quoting scripture to young people and young preachers trying to raise a generation to follow God. I didn't know what I said. If you go over to Hayden, Alabama, there's a lady by the name of Debbie Ragland that married Brother Mike Ragland and they spent their lives Try to get young people out of hell. Possibly came in this past week and took over. It's been a year today. But you know what all these people are saying right now to all of us on this side? It's all good. I want us to sing that what those last two verses again. These altars are open if you need them. Dear God in heaven, if you can't worship in this, there's no way you're saved. And I just be honest with you. If you didn't feel something pass by your way, then you're in another place. Relocate and get in this place. Alright? Don't say that again.
this time of worship. Father, most of all, we thank you for your son. Lord, we thank you for the salvation that is offered to us full and free, if only we would accept. Lord, we thank you for that eternity promise with you. Lord, I, I thank you that through these trials and temptations, you are with us. Your comforter, your helper is with us. God, we just praise your name right now in this moment. Lord, I ask that you be with Brother Dan as he comes to share this message with us, your word, your truth. Father, that you would open deaf ears and open up blinded eyes, that your gospel of truth would be heard this morning and accepted as such. Lord, we love you and we thank you for all you have done for us. Amen. As they're coming, you know, as they were getting ready to, as they were finishing that song, and I was sitting there just, as I was singing, I was reading the words of that song and thinking about the words of that song. And I, I couldn't help but think, my God, I sure would like to be beside that person right at the moment they were having to write. Could you imagine the glory that surrounded that person and the grace and the moment of that when... They, they were pinning those those words and just in knowing that these pleasures will soon be mine, my God in heaven, uh, what a song. What a, what a moment to experience the Lord. Thank you, uh, musicians, for helping us engage in some worship this morning. We do appreciate that greatly. Are you glad you're in the house of God this morning? Amen. Amen. I want you to take your Bibles to the book of Matthew. Chapter number five. I want to share with you my heart through these few months. We're moving in the month of November, December, or December. Of course, I, I I don't think it's an accident that the Lord put this concept in my heart and uh, in in front of us during this time because we're moving in a time into a time where uh, the gospel and this is a season of life in which the gospel is. Uh, it is a time where the gospel can be heard in a, in a clear manner. The birth of Jesus, the celebration of the birth of Christ coming up, and uh, Thanksgiving coming around the corner. Uh, this is uh, two of my favorite times of the year. Uh, but uh, just enjoy the fact that we're able to give thanks for what God's given us and what God's doing and then at the same time, able to celebrate the birth of the one who saved us. And, uh, God, God became flesh and dwelt among us and uh, got involved in our existence and our salvation and our, our, uh, our lives. And he didn't have to, uh, but he was just and right in doing so. And so my heart wants to spend some time, I believe, unless the Lord directs me in another direction, which is possible, but I want to spend some time encouraging us as a church to make sure that the gospel is on the forefront of our lips in the day and hour that we're living in right now. I'll be honest with you, I think the church, uh, the church has been, in a, mo in, a, in, a, in a lot of ways, it's been in what I call maintenance mode. We've, um, and, and, and to be honest with you, we didn't know how else to be because we didn't know what, what this season and this time and this new normal, as they call it, would spun into our lives, but we've just kind of been in maintenance mode. We've been trying to survive. We've been trying to figure things out. We've been trying to do some things, but um, as the Lord put it in my heart, it is time to be full steam ahead. It is time to be busy doing the work of the evangelist. It's time to get the gospel in front of people before it's eternally too late because if this is a year in which people are dying in a rapid pace, then they need to die, die knowing that Jesus is their Savior. And uh, we need to have a sense of urgency. And so my heart went into the area of the Great Commission and I started thinking in terms of... Um, the Great Commission, and, and, and we'll probably see that before it's all over with. 
but the Lord, the Spirit of the Lord, took me to this passage of Scripture. And many of you know it. Some of you probably memorized it. But there's a little phrase at the end of what I'm going to read to you. I've never really paid much attention to until this time. And there was a tuning fork went off in my heart when it happened. This is one of my favorite chapters of the Bible in the sense that God lays out the Sermon on the Mount and where he gives us the Beatitudes, in other words, what it's like to live in a kingdom atmosphere. The Beatitudes in my mind and in my heart would be this is, the, this is going to be the law of the land when he sets up his kingdom. This is how we operate. This is how we live. This is what kingdom citizens live by. This is their code. Blessed are they that mourn. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the pure in heart. This is the, this is the way kingdom citizens live their lives. But after he gets through with this beatitude and, and these, this list, he uh, commands us to rejoice and be exceeding glad for great is your reward. Then he says something in verse 13, and he begins to clarify or to describe who we are and what we are to be as Christians. Ye are. Y'all pay attention to, that two, to those two words. You are. It's not a maybe. It's not a, if you want to be. It is who we are. You and I are, what does he say? The salt of the earth. But it comes with a warning. But if the salt has lost its savior, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under the foot of men. Here's another, you are. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light to all that are in the house. Verse 16 is where my heart really pushes towards and where I believe the Lord has uh, directed uh, me and the highlight that I want to bring out. Let your light so shine. Let your light, let me rephrase that, let me put it to you. Let your light shine in such a manner before men that they may see your good works. Now watch this now. And glorify your Father, which is in heaven. <coughs> Our light is to shine in such a manner before those around us that they will see the good works that we're doing, that we're living in, and it'll be in such a manner that they will glorify the Father. Does that seem odd to you? Does that... When somebody sees you do something good, who do they usually glorify? They glorify you, don't they? How does this happen? That's what I want to preach on this morning. I, I want to preach on the Christian testimony. The Christian testimony. Will you go to the Lord in prayer with me this morning? Father, help me. Help me, so, help, help me in such a way that folks will be able to see this, understand this, and then live this. Everything starts and stops with our relationship with you. And so, Lord, I need your help. God, I really don't want nobody to see me. I really don't. I don't want nobody to hear me. Lord, I pray with all my heart that they will see you in me. They will hear you from me. And that you will be high and lifted up. And that we'll stand back and we'll sit in awe of your very presence. 
And God, it is my prayer, and I mean this with all sincerity, that they don't stand, that people today do not stand back and say, what a message. That they would hear from the exposition of your word and stand back and be able to say, what a God. What a Savior. What a Lord. Somebody may be in here and be lost. May be a good day to get that settled in their heart. Lord, draw them with the power that only you can draw them with into a place of salvation. Move in their life, and we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Every one of us have been given an opportunity to have a testimony. Now, I believe with all my heart that that is one of the hardest things in the world to be able to maintain in the world we're living in. Mainly because we're surrounded by people. Can I get a witness right there? God has given us a testimony. I have found that it is an extremely hard thing to maintain and an extremely easy thing to lose. It doesn't take a lot to lose your testimony. We can lose our temper, and we can lose our testimony. I stand guilty. We can lose patience, we can lose our testimony. We can, uh, we can get mad or get upset, and we'll lose our testimony. Our words and our actions and our thoughts uh, have an ability to affect our testimony. And as we move forward in this series and in this mindset of evangelistic outreach and, and witnessing to people, I want to home in on the personal testimony of each individual Christian. There's no doubt that the testimony that we are to live by and to, that the foundation of our te a testimony always starts and it's built upon one major principle and that is our salvation. The Lord's work in our life. The Bible here in the text right here declares us to be something and a lot of times we have to live up to this standard. We have to live up to this. And if we, I believe, if we are to be evangelistic and to be gospel driven, then we have to be willing to maintain what is called a Christian testimony. We can't just say it, we've got to live it. We can't just talk about it. We've got to live it. And our testimony is more than just what we say. It is how we live our lives out. There's no doubt we experience difficulty. And in our flesh we have a reaction. But God wants us to, uh, to live a life in which it is to reflect Christ and His character. That is a huge responsibility. That is a huge burden. But it is an awesome reward when we are able to fulfill what God has called us to be. And truly we see that we are called two things. Number one, in the midst of this, Christians are described in two ways right here in this text. Very interesting description. He describes us in the context of two lights. Number one, he describes us as salt. That's kind of peculiar, isn't it? I mean, I, I realize that some of you have been in church a while and you understand and probably been taught the context of salt in light of what we are as Christians, but the reality of it is is salt now and salt in this time is a little different. Um, now, then he describes us not only as salt, but he describes us as light. Now, without going so deep into these two descriptions, I want to let you in on this concept right here. Now, in, in the sense of being called salt, we need to understand that salt is ultimately a preservative. I know that we use it today as a flavor, which has its own application within itself. 
itself, but salt ultimately in its uh, makeup is designed and made to be a preservative. It is actually designed and its job as a preservative is to delay corruption. Did y'all hear that? Salt is a preservative that is designed to delay corruption. Some would ask, what, do you, what does that have to do with me? I believe that God is calling us as the church, as the individual Christian, He is calling us the preservative of this world. Used to be in this time and in this hour, they did not have frigid air. They did not have Kenmore. They did not have refrigeration. All they had was salt to be able to preserve meat. And if salt was, if salt was applied, and may I say this, salt was one of the most in, expensive ingredients that you could ever purchase. When salt was applied to that meat and covered in that meat, it was able to delay the corruption of that meat and the decay of that meat. Oh, my, my friends, listen to me this morning. Please hear your preacher when I say this, that when he calls us the salt of the earth, he is not just, uh, uh, just saying just idle words, but he is calling the church and each individual Christian the preserving agent of the world. I believe that what is holding back the wrath of God today is the church of the living God that exists right here on this earth. But then he, he also calls us light. And in this light, light is a power. Light is an energy force. Now please understand, I, I'm not a smart man when it comes to science. I've just got books that are... And I've learned that through my study that light is an energy source. Matter of fact, light within itself operates at such a miraculous speed that it's almost undescribable in its defining terminology as uh, um, in words. Webster basically describes it as a miracle force. <laughs> It's almost hard to wrap it, 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 it operates at such a high energy level, but the reality of it is, is when light impacts an object, it dispels confusion. Amen. Light has the ability to, uh, to get rid of anything when something, I'll, I'll, let, me, let me phrase it like this. When light hits something, or when you say in light of something, what you're saying is it's dispelling the confusion or eliminating the confusion. When light shines, it takes away, it, you're able to see it in the reality of what it is. But isn't it interesting that he calls us both salt and he calls us light? He gives us that responsibility. And to uphold that responsibility, we have to understand that I have heard sermons preached and I have preached sermons on salt, and I've preached sermons on being the light. But I believe that God puts them together in one entity to let us see what they can do when they're pulled together, operating in one force, and being what God has purposed for us to be. And that is to be have a testimony in our community, have a testimony in the, around, of those around us, to have a testimony that will impact and influence the world. Because salt uh, utilizes influence and light utilizes its energy force to, to, to work on top of an object or to work from the outside in. And salt goes from the inside out. Now, I want you to notice a couple principles this morning. Number one, I want you to notice the power of the Christian testimony. The power of the Christian testimony. I have found as I studied that salt and light are both very powerful agents. When used correctly, it can have an impact on the world that is around them. I want you to notice, first of all, underneath this, I want you to notice the influence of salt. To the believer, uh, to the believer this morning, salt uh, uh, is is applied and utilized through contact. Salt and its 
entity, it purifies, it preserves, and it penetrates. I have learned one thing about salt. You put some, How many of you have ever heard of you putting salt on a wound? Listen, when, uh, many times I've had cuts and, 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 and nicks on my body, and then I'll go to the ocean, which is composed of salt water. And over the time of the time span of being able to dive and be around that water and that salt water before it's all over with, it helps to heal the wound. Now he tells us we are to be salt. We're, to, we're, we're the purifying agent. We're the preserving agent. We're a penetrating agent. Uh, it, uh, it penetrates that which it touches. It purifies that which it touches. It uh, preserves that which, is, which it touches. The Christian must realize it has an influence on the world. I think, please hear me to this morning. Please, under, I'm going somewhere. I promise I am. Please hang with me for just a moment. The Christian does have an influence. Our, our contact with the human world, our, our ability to influence the human world is a powerful one. God has called us the salt for a reason, meaning that we have the ability to affect those that are around us by contact. When Jesus touched us, he changed us. I've oftentimes said there's no cure without contact. And I'm telling you right now that the influence that the Christian has is when he calls us salt, he's telling us that we are to be an influential part in somebody else's life. And our testimony is not just for us, it's to help somebody else. Amen. And he goes on and he says, he calls us salt, but he calls us light at the same time. Salt has its influence. Salt just changes things when it touches it. Doesn't it? I, I mess around with swimming pools a lot. I, I enjoy cleaning them. Some people think that's strange, but I've oftentimes swimming pool problems are easier than people problems. And uh, just being real with you on a Sunday morning, there's something about being on a hillside uh, with, a, uh, with a little bit of worship music in your ear and nobody around and just cleaning a swimming pool and looking at God's creation. And they have these, uh, uh, they, 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 they created in the recent years, they created these swimming pools that they call salt systems. Now, they're good when they're working. They create the prettiest of swimming pools you've ever seen. But I've learned something that they have said that when you apply, when you use these salt systems, over time, everything it touches, it has the ability to kill I, had, I was cleaning a pool one time. Bless her heart. Bless this woman's heart. She was one of those that kept their yard in pristine shape. I mean, it was blades of grass was all at the same level. It was as green and beautiful as it could be. I didn't realize she had a salt system. I went in and went to clean it. And my system has the ability to take water as well as dirt out of the pool and it discharges it. Now sometimes if I know that I've got a salt system that I'm dealing with, I attach a hose and redirect it to where I think it's not going to hit anything that it needs to kill. I forgot. I didn't realize. And I just let that machine just up chuck all that discharged salt water out into her backyard. Yes, you can imagine the brown streaks that was in that thing in just a day or two. See, salt has a purifying and a killing mechanism to it. And if Christians are to be the salt, when it touches something, that is un, uh, that, that it ought to be able to have that kind of influence and impact on something. Not that we're to kill somebody, but it should have that kind of influence on the sin of this world that is around us. When people see our lives, is it... Does it motivate us and when they are, are they motivated away from sin? But then it calls us salt, and salt has its influence, but light is it and the but the, the second thing is light has its exposure. The exposure of light is this is believe is the believer is the source of light and that it eliminates darkness when it happens. When it doesn't matter how dark it is, matter of fact, the darker the light, darker the room, the more powerful, the smaller the light becomes. I mean, it may just be a flicker of light, but isn't it amazing how when you turn on just one little bit of light, how it has the ability to eliminate the darkness in which it touches? Then why in the world is Christians being influenced and impacted more by the world than we're impacting the world? Come on, brother. I believe it's the switch has been flipped. 
we did some work on these televisions and I climbed up into the... Listen, it's dark up in this attic, by the way. And in mid-July, it's hot. Like 400 hells hot up there. And I mean, it's so dark you can't see. It's weird dark. And the first thing I did was when I turned on, I, the first thing I had to do was turn on, I turned my phone on and hit my light. And even with just the screen of my phone, I was amazed at how much that little bitty phone was able to project and eliminate the darkness that surrounded it. And the thing about it is, is the more exposure we become to the world, the more light that is has shown in a world of darkness. And, and so we've got to learn that the Christian testimony, our Christian, uh, our Christian lives, and the way we live our lives, not just in the church house, but how we live our lives at the job site, how we talk and how we live and how we make decisions, and the things that we do and the way we operate, it has an influence and it has an impact on the lives of those that are around us. God has called us to be something that I believe that the church is losing ground on. He's called us to be the salt. He's called us to, uh, to be a killing agent to the sin world and to the sin problem. He has called us to be His ambassadors. He has called us to be His representatives. He has called us to reflect the very light that He Himself has put in us to shine before a world that is dark. We've got to understand this. That the Lord highlights the Christian testimony both in two ways. He, he highlights it both individually as well as institutionally. I want you to notice in our text right here, he says that men do not, he talks about men do not light a candle and put it under a bushel. But then in the previous text, he said a city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. And in other words, he's saying to the uh, uh, we have an individual life, but we also as a church have a collective life. This, uh, as we are individuals coming together, we need to understand that the power of salt, when it is applied in large quantities, it kills, and we need to see that the power of light, when it remains lit, lit gives hope and guidance. There's a reason that the song says there is a lighthouse on a hillside. There's a reason. It's because there's a bunch of lit Christians coming together to produce a lit work to light up the world so that somebody that is lost, somebody that is... I'm about to have a time. Somebody out there in a dark world that is struggling in the world of darkness and they look to drugs and they look to alcohol and they look to rebellion and they look into relationships and they're in this wilderness of darkness struggling and they can't see where to go. They don't know how to go. And all of a sudden there's a flicker. All of a sudden there's a light that keeps a beaming. And it, all it is is a, they say, what is that? Where is that? And the thing about it is, this light has the ability to attract bugs. And the light of the Christian world has the ability to attract sinners that are lost in darkness. And when they see a bunch of lit up Christians coming together underneath the banner of Christ, it gives them hope and it gives them guidance. Man. You know why our, the power of the Christian testimony is so important? It's because the world is watching us. The world is looking at us. They want to see how we handle COVID. They want to see how we live in faith. They want to see how we operate. They want to see how we do. Listen to me. You think that you didn't do anything this morning but get up and go to church. But I guarantee you there's somebody next door to you that was wondering, are they going to get up and go this morning? Is it going to be worth it to them this morning? I know I've been seeing them every week get up. And I know I've been seeing them every now and then. They put on their clothes and they get in there. Where do they go on that Sunday morning when everybody's sleeping in? And when the world's trying to get over a hangover? Why is it that they're going there? But I'll tell you this right now, I promise you this, that somewhere along the line, just you getting in your car, driving here on a Sunday morning, is a light shining in a world of darkness that's telling them that there is a place of hope. There is a banner, and a bloodstained banner that tells you where to go. And it's not that we're pointing them towards us. It's that there's a light that is being reflected off of us from the light of Christ onto them. Amen. Listen to me power of the Christian testimony is this. He's calling us salt and 
not, there's, not, there's not too much more powerful than those two entities. Salt in large quantities kills. I mean, to, listen to me. I promise you this. When I got done dispersing all that salt water on that woman's yard, you could tell where the salt's been. Let me ask you this. We go, <laughs> we go leave this room, we leave out of here, and we disperse into this world. Can we look back in a day or two and tell where we've been? Come on, brother. Is there evidence in our lives? Is there a testimony in our lives? Is there that kind of power in our lives to look back over the course of our our, our weekly agenda and be able to say, well, I don't know why I've been there. There's evidence. There's been contact. There's been influence. There's been impact. Let me ask you something this morning. Are you impacting the world as we should? Are we letting our... I mean, God's calling us two of the most powerful forces on the planet. He's calling us salt and He's calling us light. And there's not anything more powerful than those two components. Now, I want you to notice not only the power of the Christian testimony, but I want you to notice the protection of the Christian testimony. Please pay attention to this. It must be guarded. It is important that the Christian works diligently to protect their testimony in order to maintain its potency. He gives us two warnings here. Now, I find it very interesting of how these two warnings are contextualized here but he says that the salt has the ability to lose its flavor or savior. During this time, salt is, was an element that was found inside the earth. It was a very precious element that is being found. It, it, uh, it, it has its abilities to do all kinds of things such as preserve, to purify, to penetrate, to, to heal, to cure. I mean, it has all those kinds of abilities. But... Uh, but there's something that, there, there's an ability of this salt to be able to lose its potency, to be able to lose its ability to impact and to do those things that it was designed to do. And when they would dig these, this element up, they would work very diligently to, to keep this element from, this element called salt from being exposed to the elements of this world. Y'all with me so far? If, if, this, if salt during this time, which it, 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 it operated, it kind of looked like, a, like gravel, so to speak, when it would come out in chunks, so to speak, and, and, and when, they would, when they would mine this substance out, and when they would apply it, and they would use it for all these different things, but over time, if it ever got exposed to too much of the elements of the world, uh, of the elements of the environment that is around it, then what would happen was it would begin to lose its ability to be potent. In other words, it would lose its purification. It would use, lose its penetrating ability. It would lose its savor or its potency is what it would do. And that's a warning. He says if the salt loses its savor, in other words, if the salt gets exposed to much, too much of the elements of the world, then it's going to lose its ability to have an impact. Now, you're thinking to yourself, well, that's awful hard. I thought I was supposed to be applied to this world. I, listen to me. Understand, exposed to the elements and making contact with the world is two different things. See, I think a lot of times when they get, and here's what would happen. If it was ever too much exposure to take place, or there's ever too much exposure into the world, of the elements of the world, it would say, okay, this is no good. Well, what would they do? They would use it to, uh, uh, to line their driveways with, or to line their walkways with, and it would be trampled on as you would walk on the gravel, uh, gravel car, pathway. That's exactly what they'd use it for. In other words, it would be trampled upon. It would be beat down. Can I tell you something I'm seeing in the day and hour we're living in? I'm seeing that the Christian, rather than having an impact on the world, is allowing the world to have an impact on them. I've seen the church of the living God rather than being the salt of the life that it's supposed to be, having more of it, having letting the world be of more of an influence on it. And so what is happening today, and you see it right now if you've ever seen it before, the church is being trampled on by the foot of men. The Christian today is being put down and put away and put aside and we're no longer, uh, we're no longer, nobody respects the preacher when he walks into the room. There ain't nobody changes their language when the Christian walks in. There ain't nobody uh, maneuvers the way they're doing because when the Christian goes in, but they mock them and they ridicule them and they make fun of them. Is why? It's because you can't tell a difference between what's going on inside 
going on outside in the world. Great, brother. <sighs> Salt can lose its flavor by being exposed to too much of the elements of the world. I believe this with all my heart. We can't win the world by being the world. We have sacrificed the gospel on the altar of relevance. Can I say that again? We have sacrificed the gospel on the altar of relevance. Oh, there's hypocrites. Yes, I agree, they are. But can I be honest with you? Can we all be honest with each other? Isn't there just a little bit of hypocrisy in all of us? I mean, get right down to it. Don't we all have a little bit of hypocrisy in us? I mean, my Lord in heaven, I mean, yeah, there's hypocrites, but here's the thing. Here's the thing. You know what the problem is? is the, the problem is, is this, is there's been so little conversion in the last hundred years that now we've got religious people sitting in the church today and sitting on the pews today, and they live and they, they worship and they sing their songs on Sunday, but they live like hell on Monday through Saturday. And now we come in and we want to just... I mean, we want to just tell how good God is and how much we love the Lord, but the reality of it is, is there's no impact and there's no testimony in our lives to prove and to, to show and to have an impact on anybody's lives because in the our world's eyes, there's no difference between them and us. Amen. <laughs> the light can be hidden. Now, I want you to pay attention to this. I didn't see this until I studied this. Light can be hidden, but I find that it can't be put out. I've never seen this before. Salt will lose its savor, will lose its potency. Then they just throw it out and they just let you walk on it. But light can be hidden, it just can't be snuffed. Why? And this is just me asking the Lord, why? What's, what, if we are the salt, okay, and we are the light, then what? I can hide it, but I can't eliminate it. I mean, my light anyway. Y'all with me? It's not my light that's shining anyway. I had no light to begin with. The light that I'm projecting is not my light, it's the light of Christ. He is the light. The Bible says that Christ, God, is the light. And He is reflecting upon us, and He is shining through us, and I, we don't get to flip the switch and cut it off. But we can hide it. We can cover it up. The thing about it is, church, is this. Salt can lose its savor, We, we have light because he is light. There's two things I want you to understand right here. God did not intend for Christians to become trampled on, nor did, he intend, nor did God intend for his light to be hidden by shame. Romans 1, Paul said it best. He said, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation to the Jew first and then to the Greek. God did not intend for Christians to be trampled. That was not God's job. God wanted Christians to be the light. He wanted Christians to be something that brought flavor and brought substance and brought purification and to be something that impacted when it contacted. He did not want the Christian to be so exposed to the elements of this philosophy, the philosophies of this world that it starts to operate by its own philosophies and being indoctrinated by its own humanistic ideas and be, uh, and be start to be able to question whether the inerrancy of Scripture is true or to be able to start questioning whether the gospel is really what it says it is, and to be able to, and so what we've done is we rather than rather than step up and say, hey, this is not right, we've allowed the world to impact us rather than us impact the world. And then in doing so, we've allowed the shame of our salvation to be hidden so that light can be unexposed. We've got to protect our testimony. 
by allowing it not to be hidden and not to be affected by the elements of this world. But I want you to notice this last thing, and I'll be done. This is where I wanted to get to anyway. This last thing right here says this. I see the, the power of the Christian testimony. We are salt and light. We're two of the, it causes two of the most powerful elements there is. The protection. We have to protect those things. We can't hide it. If we hide it, it's going to be unexposed. And if we lose its savor because it's been affected by the elements of this world, then it's going to lose its flavor and lose its potency. What's the purpose of the testimony? The purpose. The purpose of the Christian testimony is not for us. I hear testimonies all the time. I love hearing testimonies. But I believe in the leaders that we're in the society that we're living in, that people's testimony has almost become narcissistic. The testimony of the believer has almost become so narcissistic. In other words, it's so much consumed about them and who they are and what they were that they are celebrated more than God ever intended for. Why is it? Let me, let me put it to you like this. Can I, can I phrase it like this? Why is it that we can, and this is, this is our mindset. I want you to understand something. This is how we're thinking, and I want, this is, this is changing me. We can have somebody that has been, lived in the gutters of life, beat up by hell and the world, Drug addict, drug addictions, everything under the sun. From from you make you take the most about the 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 depraved of things, and that's what they've been exposed to all their lives. They stand up and they tell about all that God, all that they were, all that they were, all that they were, and then they say, "God saved me," and we celebrate it, and we say that person's got such a powerful testimony. Over here, we discard the one that grew up in church, lived a pure life, never cussed much or at all, never drank, smoked, done drugs or anything else like that, but needed the same salvation that that one did. Come on, brother. And this one's over here. Thinking I'm just glad to be saved. Amen. This one's over here thinking I'm just glad to be saved. But the reality of it is, is for some reason or another, we've we've given this one the power, the powerful testimony, and we've discarded this one. You know why? It's because the testimony has become about us and not him. Faith, brother. This morning, will you put verse 17 up there, or 16 for me? Verse 16, just let us see this for a second. I'll be done. I'm coming to a landing for you. If you can get that up there. I'm working on it. I know. Verse 7, 16, it says this. You write your Bibles, you can read it. If you don't, you can get up here on the screen. It'll come up here in a minute. He says this. What is, my, what is the purpose of my testimony? He says it like this, that our light should shine in such a manner, so shine before men in front of the world. That's our testimony. The light within us. Remember what I said. Salt and light are two different entities. Salt can be trampled on. But remember, light can't be cut off, can it? That our light should so shine in such a manner before men. That's our testimony. And it's not us that should be. That is the testimony. It's him. It's his light. It's his. It's his work. It's his doings. It is all about him. And it should shine before men. The light of the glorious gospel of Christ should so shine upon humanity. 
glorified. And it says this, to let your light so shine before them so that they can see your good works. Well, red flag just goes up right there because I find that Romans tells me that there's nothing good in me. And you know what? My Bible tells me right. And so what are they seeing? They're not seeing my good works. They're seeing God's work in me. They're seeing God work through me. And the fact of the matter is, is we as Christians have tried to take over and we've tried to we've tried to allow God's light to shine when it made us feel good, but the power and the purpose of the Christian testimony is to number one, be a witness to the world. To be a witness to the world. That they who, that the people around us, that the people at the job should see the goodness of God, should see the glory of God, should see the magnificence of God. I mean, there should be people that could come and they're not looking for us to tell them just what our story is, but our story should reflect His glory. <laughs> and when they see it, they don't say, man, what a testimony. They say, man, what a God. Do you see the difference between the way we project our testimonies to be now versus the way the Bible wants the Christian testimony to be portrayed? We have made the Christian testimony all about us. When the reality of it is, is when they see it. We should not only be a witness to the world, but number two, we should be a witness of God. Yeah. That when they see that light and the work due to that light, they should glorify God. What I saw in light of it. You know what should happen is when two people on both ends of the spectrum stand up and give their testimony, we should not, we should not say, what a powerful testimony. We need to be able to stand up and say, what a powerful God. Because the reality of it is the same powerful God has to, had, to, had to reach down and save both sinners to pray you know, on their way to hell. What is the purpose of our testimony? It's not to go and air out all of our laundry and then to talk about how, how God walked in and saved us and how that I mean, it, sometimes we get so focused even on the change that has been made in my life and the change that's been made in, in my life and what God's done in my life. But the fact of the matter is, is the reality of it is if we get right down to it, what are we doing? All we're doing is shining light on us. When the reality of it is, is we should be so far removed from the equation that nobody sees us, but they see the light of the glorious gospel of Christ. Let me ask you something. I want you to an don't answer this out loud. Do we operate in such a way that when we when we do something, when we serve? What a church. What a singer. What a preacher. What a message. What a lesson. What a testimony. God sitting up in heaven thinking, what about me? It's my light. It's my it's my word. It's my work. Why are they getting credit for this? That's humbling, isn't it? That's humbling to consider. But it's what God wants out of us. That's what's called. You want a powerful Christian testimony? A powerful Christian testimony does not reflect. The depravity of man, it, it reflects the glory of God. I'm going to say that on this side. A powerful Christian.
Christian testimony does not reflect and celebrate the depravity of man. That's where I go back to the fact that the reason we're being trampled on is because we've sacrificed We've sacrificed the glory and the gospel of Jesus Christ on the altar of relevance because we want to make everybody feel good because we've been down the same boat. But what and, and the reality of it is, and honest to God truth, is we're not different from anybody else. The only thing that makes me one bit different from me and the pimp on the street corner is the fact that the light of the glorious gospel of Christ has been reverted and shines through me now. I am changed not because I just made a decision. I am changed because God did a work in my life. I'm, not, I'm different not because, not because I just decided to turn over a new leaf. I'm different because the power of the gospel moved into me. And, I became, and it was a new creation. I became a new creature in Christ because of Him. Not because of If we don't have this testimony, the world is never going to see the light. They're never going to experience the changing effect of salt. We should reflect that light in such a manner that when men see us in operation, they don't even have to hear us. They just stand back and say, And then I can possibly ask, if a God that did that in you, what do you do? And then that's when we get our fight for it. Let me tell you. Let me tell you about this man named Jesus. What he's capable of doing. If you will let him in. I wonder if anybody in here other than me needs a little work on their testimony. Any work of anybody other than the preacher this morning needs a little needs a little touch on the testimony. Needs to pile up an altar this morning and get some things right. Get to a point where we know that my testimony is not about me, but it's about him. And I promise you this: this will change the way you live your life, the way you act out in your life. Too. It does mean. I wonder if our, Miss Lisa, if you would come to the piano this morning. I wonder if we'd just bow our heads and close our eyes this morning. Here's, here's the invitation. I'm saying, you know, it's been too much about me. My testimony does not reflect the light and is not influencing the world like I know I need to. I'm allowing too much of the world to influence me. I wonder this morning how many people would come out of their seats and ask this question. Ask God. God, change my testimony so that it will reflect your glory, your gospel, and not my story. Not just me, but it will reflect you. Will there be anybody this morning that asked that question? You may not have that. Here's the, here, here's the next part. You may be lost and need to be saved. You don't even have a testimony. There's a, there, there, there may be one in here, a multiple people in here that are operating in religion and they're operating in their own power, in their own mind, their own ability. And this powerful light moving at such a rate, such an energy level, wants to make you a new creature. And yet, pride in the way. In all your life is doing is reflecting.
look to you and not him. <coughs> this altar is open for you to do business with the Lord. If you need to ask God and say, God, fix my testimony. And he'll do that this morning. And you'll let him. surgery may be up and coming in her life and uh, please add her to that list if you can there's the discipleship the title of this week's discipleship is my testimony matters it is scripture that hinges on having spirit our spiritual identity and influencing the world and our, our who we are in Christ having an impact on the world and I hope it helps you there's a calendar there. I want you to make note of some things on the calendar. Uh, tomorrow morning, no, Tuesday morning, am I right? Or is it Monday? Tomorrow morning. Tomorrow morning. I, these no Monday school days have messed my whole internal clock up. So, um, so tomorrow morning at 8 a.m., we're going to meet here at the church. We're going to go and help a lady put a ramp on her house as well as fix some deck boards on her deck. Just it's an elderly uh, elderly family. It's a family that is in need. And uh, if you got tools, you can bring those. Crowbar, hammer, drill, uh, nail gun, whatever you can bring. If you can do that, we're going to start. We're going to meet here at 8 a.m. We're going to go over and do some work for this dear lady and this family and be a blessing to them. Uh, the 8th of November, uh, there's going to be a baby shower for Laura Tuck. Uh, something that I haven't put in there yet is the 15th of November. Uh, Miss Peggy is going to be hosting a, a, a baby shower for Teresa. DHR has given her, uh, has handed her, handed over an eight month old or nine, one a one month old baby. And her having her own children now, she needs some help. And uh, so uh, we're going to try to help them out. And uh, there's going to be a baby shower over here for them. Um, we're going to have uh, dinner on the grounds on uh, on the 22nd. That will be our Thanksgiving service. But before then, we're still working and hoping to hear back from our food distribution. Please make note that when you go back here, look at those cans and all that stuff that's to be supplied. We're trying to collect some food that will help families be able to provide for their, have a, their own Thanksgiving meal and they can cook their own meal. Miss Jamie has set some cans and some examples of what can be purchased back there. If you would, go purchase at least one or two of those, a couple of those items, and we can distribute those, put them in bags, and when we're distributing food, we can put those in, hopefully on the 21st of November, and be able to hand those to them. So that's coming up pretty quick, so let's try to make that happen if it's possible. If you have any questions about that, see Miss Jamie Osborne. I also want to thank everybody for your help with the... Uh, with a trunk or treat last night, it was fun. Kids had a ball. Uh, we received way too much candy than what we needed, and uh, and then. But I think 
I want to say we were well over three to four hundred people who came in. There was two. Uh, we had two hundred hot dogs. Not everybody ate a hot dog, and um, I mean there, we were able to minister. And every person that came in got a gospel track. So I'm praising the Lord for that. But uh, if you don't have one of these, pick those up. Uh, our Bible studies, gonna, ladies' Bible studies, gonna be at Tiffany's house tonight. Prayer meetings will be here at six this evening. We'll be utilizing this as our guide. Um, and uh, if we, if you need to come and pray, just come and pray with us uh, today. Listen, after, I, all of this is in here. If, you, if it's back there, grab one. If you need one, I'll give you one, or I'll get one printed up for you. All right. I love you. I appreciate you so much. Let's be dismissed in a word of prayer if you need to give. Yes, Brother Chuck, thank you. If you're interested in singing in the choir or being a part of the choir, hang around just for a brief minute right up here so Brother Chuck can meet with you. They're going to be working on some things in the near future. And uh, so if you were a part of the choir or would like to be helping out with the choir, if there's interest in doing that, uh, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna be implementing a choir again soon. So meet with Brother Chuck right after service right up here. Outside of that, that's all I got. I hope that's everything. If it's not... Uh, we'll figure it out, all right? Listen, let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you for your work this morning. Help us this morning, in Jesus' name, to live out what we just learned in your word. And, and we'll praise you for it. Amen. Amen.